in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we continue to rejoice, Lord, in your presence. We thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight to look at your word, the living word, that we may be strengthened as we finish the service tonight and know where we are at in our spiritual walk. We pray that we will have a clear listening ear and an obedient heart. We thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is present here with us to teach us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's begin with uh, a couple of illustrations. As you see the pictures, what thoughts come to your mind? Anyone? Christmas. Christmas. Joy. Christmas, joy. Celebration. I'm sorry? Celebration. Celebration. Santa Claus. Santa Claus. That's the key person. Yes. Anything else? I think this picture is in the mall where people will be shopping and buying Party. stuff. Mall. Yeah. Lot Jesus. Of Birth of Jesus. Birth of Jesus. Very good. Thank you all. Why did Christmas happen? To remember the birth of Jesus. To remember the birth of Jesus. Thank you, Pranthi. To save us from sin. A little louder, please. Because man was helpless and they couldn't save themselves. And since God loved us, he had to send his son to save us. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. The second illustration <clears throat> we are going to see is an observation from my friend. And as you look at the picture, what expression do you see in the, on the face of this child? Confused. Confused. Perfect. And uh, you can't expect a better expression to, to demonstrate confusion in somebody's face. The eyes, look at those eyes, want to accept something on the right eye and the left eye, mm, I don't know. And as the child grows older, the expression becomes a little clearer. Wow, I can't believe it. My friend, as I said, this is an observation my, from my friend. He said, I came from a Hindu background. I accepted Christ in my life through the testimony to the influence of one of my friends. But when I came to church, what I, sh what I saw, what I witnessed, it shocked me. It was beyond belief. People were jockeying for power. They were for positions. They were filled with pride. They even tripped the pastor. And so on and so forth. And uh, having come from a Hindu background, he expected all the Christians inside the church would be different. But what he saw was another scenario. We saw when we started the series, a bunch of verses from 1st John. You don't have to see all of them, but you can remember. Of course, if you had opened your Bible, one of the verses is right there. 3, 9 is there. You can take a look at it. And if you can remember, all of these would point to one particular thing. Are these texts from 1st John 
not address to the false claim that born again people are morally indistinguishable from the world. There's a false claim. We think born again people are indistinguishable from the world. The Bible is very aware of such people in the church. That is the simple reason why John, first John, the epistle was written. If you summarize what we would see in those verses and what you see in the church, it is not that born again people are permeated with worldliness, but the church is permeated by people who are not born again. That's the sad truth. The church is filled with people who are not born again. Let's keep the thought as we venture into the darkness of the night when the light was about to be dawned on a person. This is the conversation which we were, we've been pivoting on for quite some time in this series. When the Jewish rabbi came to Jesus, Jesus tells him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We spend quite some time in understanding what it means by being born again. After spending time on the what side of things, we went to the why side of things. Why should I be born again? We spent quite a bit of time there. We are going to continue tonight from where we left. If you could recall where we left, that would be good, but it will also give you some of the synopsis of what we saw so far, so, so you can recollect. This study, please note, will have two key features. Number one, it makes the connection between the incarnation of Christ, colloquially known as Christmas, and the born again experience also known as regeneration. The second feature is it attempts to carry forward the question in the previous study, which is what will we miss out? What will we miss out on if we are not born again? If you're not born again, what are we going to miss out? So these are the two key features, two part study and we don't know how when how time will determine when we will finish and we will see how how far we can go into these two features so we will see we will see god's help as we try to do a uh, come take a logical break in tonight's message if anyone has english standard version I would love for them to read from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Read it aloud if you have ESV. See what kind of love the Father has Father given to has us. Given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. <clears throat> Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself 
as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Let's ask the question, Prakash answered it, why Christmas? Now we are going to see why Christmas from 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. If you pay attention, you will see what, what, where it talks about Christmas and why Christmas. So twice, twice in 1 John, the, the portion we read, we are told why Christmas happened. That is, why Jesus Christ, the eternal divine Son of God, came into the world as a human being. Look at verse 5. John says, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. He appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So the sinlessness of Christ is affirmed. In him there is no sin. And the reason for his coming is affirmed. The sinless, sinlessness of Christ is affirmed. And also the reason for his coming is affirmed. He appeared to take away sins. In him there is no sin. And he appeared to take away sin. Then let's go to verse 8. John says... The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The specific focus John has in mind was when he says works of the devil is the sin that the devil promotes. The first part of verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So the works of the devil that Jesus came to destroy is what? They are the works of sin. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, which, is, which are the works of sin. So two times John tells us that Christmas happened. The Son of God became human for the simple reason to take away sin. That is, to destroy the works of the devil, namely sin. And you go all the way to the Gospels, starting with Matthew, you see, if Jesus was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, he came as a human being. Remember, that is what is all important. He is not just sitting as a God and trying to solve the problem. His, his problem solving was different. He came, he was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, and he grew up like you and me, but 
he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's what we see it in Luke 252. Then the way he conducted himself as captured in Philippians 2, 5 to 8 and Hebrews 4, 15 is, he was perfectly obedient and sinless in all his life and ministry, all the way to the point of death. He was perfectly obedient and sinless all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. For the simple reason, in order to destroy the works of the devil, to take away sin. So the question we need to answer is, what is the incarnation, that is the birth of Christ or Christmas and regeneration? What is the connection between those two? We are talking about Jesus's incarnation and our regeneration. That's the focal point here. What's the connection between Jesus's birth and our new birth? It is reiterated so that we can understand Jesus's birth on one side and our new birth. What's the connection? What's the relationship between Jesus's incarnation and our regeneration? To answer this question, we need to build a bridge from where we left that is part six and seven we did last month to the text we read just now from first John three, one to 10. If you would consider part six and seven and first John three, one to 10, the attempt that we are going to make is to build a bridge. If you would stay and pay attention. In those messages, part six and seven, we discussed that when we ask why we need to be born again, that's a key thing we address in, in those two messages. Why, why we need to be born again? The answer was twofold. One was to look looking for, backward to our miserable condition in sin. The second way we did was we could look forward to the great, great things we will miss if we are not born again, like entering the kingdom of God. The looking back part of the discussion, we gave 10 answers as to why we need to be born again in the first sense. The second one, looking forward, we gave five answers for why we need to be born again. That is looking forward to what we will not enjoy if we are not born again. The bridge between parts six and seven of our message in Born Again series and tonight's text in 1 John 3, the bridge. If you look at your Bible, you will see that is the great love of God that gives life to people like you and me who are at enmity with God and are dead in trespasses and sins, giving life to us. What is giving life to us? The great love of God, and that is the bridge. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. So the greatness of the love of God is the focus there. What does it do? It gives us spiritual life. That is the born again experience, the new birth. And particularly to those who have no claim on God at all, because we are at enmity with God. We were spiritually dead. And in our deadness, we were walking in lockstep with God's arch enemy, the devil. You see that in Ephesians 2, 2, we, we discussed that. The justice of God 
would have been fully justified, would have been well served if we had perished forever in that condition. Because we were at enmity with God, we were moving away from God. But for that very reason, our new birth, the born again aspect that Jesus is talking about, that's our being made alive. It's a great demonstration of the greatness of the love of God. Remember Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We owe all our spiritual life and all its impulses everything to the greatness and the freedom of the love of God. If you can capture that thought tonight, that is the thing. That, that is the most important thing. If you can understand that part, the great love of God, why would he love me? Now, this is the bridge to 1 John 3, 1 to 2, the great love of God for those who are not yet in his family. This is what it says, the first two verses, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are. What kind of love? There's the link with the greatness of the love of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It continues, beloved, that means loved ones. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Now we are entering into the phase, a key phase in the message. To learn some key observations from the passage that we read. There will be four observations that connect this text with the greatness of the love of God in Ephesians 2, 4, part one, right? And it will also connect with the question in part six and seven we discussed about why we need to be born again. Observation one, when verse one says that we are called the children of God, just focus on that word. We are called the children of God. It is not something. It doesn't mean we are already the children of God, but not called that, and then called us that. It doesn't mean that way. It means that we were not children of God to start with. We were like the rest of the world, which is called out in verse 1. We were dead and outside the family of God. Then God called us children. And we became children of God. Have you noticed the words, and so we are? Verse 1, we are God, we are called children of God, and so we are. The point is, God made us his children. Note down, God made us his children. He, we can understand it from the life of Lazarus. He did this with his call. Lazarus come out. The way he raised Lazarus from the dead. What did Jesus do? He simply called him. Lazarus come out. And the call gave life to Lazarus. Jesus called Lazarus. And Lazarus got his life back. That's what we see in John 11, 43, the call imparted life. That is the new birth. God made us alive just as he did in Ephesians 2, 5, when we were dead in trespasses and sins. So what is observation number one? We are made God's children. We are made God's children. Let's go to observation two. This new birth into the family of God is due to something. What is that? It is due to the greatness of the love of God 
And we see that here in First John 3, just as we saw in Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. He gives an exclamatory word there, see, meaning look, this is amazing. What kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. John was amazed. He was writing the epistle and he was so amazed he shouts out see just as Paul did and just as we should be we should all be doing why because we were rebels we were enemies and we were dead and unresponsive slaves to sin and we are made alive and we are born again and called the children of God. John, when he used the word see, he wanted us to feel the wonder of faith. A dead person at this stage listening to the message will not be able to have that excitement. It's not because of, a, of anything else. It's because of simple, it's not anything or familiarity or repeated message. No, 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 no. It's because we are dead, still dead in our trespasses. That is why we are not able to see what John calls out and he wants us to feel the wonder of it. That's why he begins with C. So what is observation number two? The greatness, the greatness, you can't quantify it. The greatness of the love of God is not a simple love. Such a great thing that completely inverted our status. Observation number three. This amazing love of God that gave us life when we were dead and caused us to be born again and brought us into the family of God. All the things that we saw so far also secures our final perfection in the presence of God forever. This is a key point to understand. He didn't just call us, revive us, and left us alone. He is taking it all the way to the end. He secures our final perfection in the presence of God forever. If you pay attention, you will see connection, three things connected here. The love of God for us was to our present life as his children and the future we long for. The love of God for us, the present life as his children being born again and the future we long for. Yes, of the word go, was goes. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. What is the link John C here? What are we now? And what we will be when Christ comes. That is the unbreakable link John sees. Your current condition and your future condition. He expresses, he expresses it with the words, we know. With certainty he proclaims, we know. We are God's children now. See whether that word is there in your Bible. And what we will be has not yet appeared meaning our perfect conformity to Christ awaits his coming. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. What a transformation. In other words, the perfection of our sonship is surely coming. The perfection of our sonship. He adopted as his sons, as we read in Ephesians 1. Is that is surely coming. We know it is how because of his love we are his children now because of god's greatness of his love we are his children now so we know our perfection is coming 
And all that is left in our adoption is the consummation of our transformation when we see Jesus face to face. When we, what? See Jesus face to face. I hope you caught the word, the word see right there and the, the, the implication thereof. His presence will complete it for all the children of God. And we are God's children now. What is observation number three? Our final perfection is secured. So to the, now we see how John is beginning to address the question from parts six and seven, why we should what will we miss if you're not born again on the on the, the positive side? What will we miss if you're not born again? Let's connect that as we see was observation four. The final observation is to make explicit something already is obvious, whatever we have been discussing. It's very obvious, but when we infer it, when we discuss it, we will know for certain and be filled with joy or filled with sorrow. The new birth is a necessary prerequisite. It's not a simple prerequisite. It is a necessary, it is not an optional. It's a necessary prerequisite. Which one? New birth. And it is also a guarantee of our future perfection in the presence of Christ forever. To understand that, we need to go to the same verse, John 3, 3, in which Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Throw the limelight on the word see now. But if you are born again, you will see the kingdom of God. Or if you use the words of 1 John 3, you will see Christ to Christ face to face and be perfected and spend eternity with joy in his presence. John 3, 3, once more, one more time, if you could make that connection. John 3, 3, in a positive way, if you are born again, you will see the kingdom of God. In 1 John 3, you will see Christ face to face and be perfected and spend eternity in his presence with joy. Observation 4, as we put everything together, is there is a necessity, an absolute necessity for the new birth. So Christmas is not shopping in the mall. It is not Santa Claus. It is not having the biggest Christmas tree at home. None of those. Christmas is not dead. But in our still not born again condition, our focus is still on those things. And not only we have this disease, we encourage our children to catch this virus. So much of an excitement about what it is not, but there's scant respect for what it is. And all these indicate that we are not born again. Here's a quick recap as we wind down tonight's discussion. We want to answer the question, why must we be born again? John's answer is, because if you are not born again, you will not look upon Jesus someday. And in the twinkling of an eye, be changed into his image. We understand the theoretical part of rapture. 
we understand the theoretical part of we will see Jesus someday. But we stop short of coming to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the longer we gamble on things, thinking that going to church is good enough for me. Having been baptized as a child is good enough for me. Having been confirmed in a church is good enough for me. Those are all our own rules that we made for ourselves. But John's answer, repeat, is if we, if we are not born again, we will not look upon Jesus someday. And we will not be taken up with him when he comes. Instead, we will remain under the wrath of God. This is where it is about John chapter 3. is very important. Go all the way and verse 36. There you see what is clearly stated. Am I being judgmental? Far be it from me. No. It is the word of God that calls that out. And the God who gave those words is still standing there at the door of your heart and knocking. You've been coming to church and you're doing it as a ritual. You've been reading your Bible and you're doing it as a ritual. When are you going to surrender your life? If you hear the knock, open the door. As we see the negative side of things, we'll also see some positive things. If the immeasurable love of God, as you open the door by hearing his knock, if that immeasurable love of God causes you to be born again and gives you new spiritual life in union with Jesus Christ, you know that when he appears, you will be like him. That's a promise given in the scripture in tonight's portion. Because of the new birth, you know you will enter the kingdom of God. That is a promise guaranteed by Jesus, reiterated by John. That is why we must be born again. So my friend, If you are confused about the still to be born again Christians in your church, and as you look around and see people denying Christ by their behavior, let it not bother you. You just need to focus on Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus. And the good news for you is, since you came from a Hindu background and you've accepted Christ, and it is applicable yes, to each one of us, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word children of God is repeated. So that is the good news for you and me. If we have received him, believed in his name, we are born again. Ask yourself that question. I'm hearing this message over and over again. Nothing but the same message every time. Am I responding to the call of God? Tonight is the time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for giving us one more opportunity, Lord, with the greatness of your love, calling us to be your children. We pray, Lord, that we will hear your knock at the door clearly and evaluate our condition and have the boldness to come and open the door and as you said, you will come in and you will dine with us 
and be with you. We thank you for the promises given in the scripture that when we are born again, we will see you face to face. If you're not born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. Help us to understand that, Lord, that our very life is at stake tonight. And if you are born again, Lord, we pray that we will be bold enough to go and share the good news with our family, our friends, and invite them to experience the joy. We pray, Lord, this week as we enter into our respective responsibilities you have given us, we pray that we will honor you with the joy that you have given us now that we have been born again. And we pray that we will glorify your name. We give you all praise, honor, and glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you. Thank you.